Tonight on KQED Newsroom, it's time to head back to school, virtually that is. The pandemic tests students, parents and teachers like never before as schools scramble to balance safety with lesson plans. Also, the debate around reopening schools reveals growing race and equity gaps among different communities within school districts. And the stress and pressure parents face to meet their kids' educational and emotional needs. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. Classes resume this month with distance learning as the new normal in education. Everyone agrees it's not an ideal situation, but there's less concurrence on how to make the best of this bad situation. School districts throughout the state have been preparing for a more robust online education program than they could offer in the spring when the pandemic first struck. At that time, teachers and parents struggled with distance learning, from simply getting online to getting assignments done. Tonight, we consider the challenges and opportunities the new school year brings when instruction shifts online. Joining me now by Skype from Richmond is KQED Senior Editor of Education and Equity, Julia McAvoy. And joining by Skype from Austin, Texas, is Dr. Alicia Smith Ariaga, the Executive Director of the Education Trust West. Thank you both for joining us. Good to be here. Julia, let's start with you. Most of California's six million school children are going back to school this month, but online only. There is a process to get a waiver for elementary school kids. Could you tell us about the criteria for that? Yeah, Priya, schools and uh, districts, which are in counties where the COVID caseload is under 200 per 100,000 residents, they can apply, but then they've got to meet all sorts of safety criteria, plans for distance learning, small cohorts of kids, a clear communication plan with parents, and what they'll do if a case surfaces. So there's a lot of things that they have to plan for, including the buy-in of labor if they're public schools, before they can get approved by their local public health authority. All right, Alicia, I want to talk to you about a poll that you all conducted with Education Trust West, your advocacy organization for educational justice for California students. You've conducted a couple of surveys, one of parents of school-age children ranging from K through 12th grade and another for zero to age five. What concerns did you hear from parents, particularly when it comes to distance learning? Well, we heard concerns from parents across the state about their students and the return to school and whether or not they would really have the academics they needed to be able to get through this year. And so 90% of parents in that poll expressed concerns about distance learning in the, in the fall. And almost 40% of parents across California in the poll noted that they had issues either connecting to the internet or a lack of devices. Uh, we also heard a lot from parents about the inability to actually provide food and other supports to students as well. Now, isn't food being handled at school sites still? So food is being handled at school sites across the state. And one of the issues actually with that is that although it's really important and it's been a great service that schools have been providing, many schools did not budget to provide those services. And so many of the fiscal issues that we're all concerned about around COVID are really being set up to disproportionately impact schools next fall if you don't get more assistance from the federal government directed towards schools for COVID recovery. And Julia, there was also a national poll that released results this week from NPR and Ipsos, and it surveyed teachers specifically around this question of reopening schools. What are some of the key findings from that poll? Well, I think like what we're hearing from parents, there are a lot of concerns on the part of teachers. The poll, which uh, queried 500 teachers across the state, both private and public, found that like 82% of teachers are really concerned about going back and really one in three of them really prefer to teach uh, primarily remotely. So teachers, you know, they're concerned about safety, both of themselves, their families and their students. And I just don't think there's a lot of trust right now on their part that districts and even their counties can verify that that would be a safe environment to return to at this point. Julia, distance learning has also revealed big gaps when it comes to equity for low-income households and students of color. Could you share with us some of the problems that are specific to these vulnerable communities around distance learning? And if any of the problems that cropped up in the spring seem like they will be addressed and adjusted this fall? Great question. I mean, in the spring, the big problem was this scramble for digital devices and internet connections for 
I think it was 1.2 million across the state. At this point, uh, Superintendent of Schools uh, Tony Thurmond, state superintendent, has said that 700,000 California students still lack devices and about 300,000 lack internet hotspots. So the digital divide remains a huge hurdle and those students are going to be left at the starting gate when it comes to online learning. So I can't think of a more fundamental mm. equity issue than that. But that aside, um, we've got uh, kids at home who uh, their parents might be at work. They can't monitor what they're doing online. They can't help them do work or even understand what the teacher is asking for. Some of those children of frontline workers are having to watch their siblings. And then you've got kids who are in households. Um, a student I know, she's in a, a one-bedroom apartment with five children. Her parents are out working. And she had to go into her car just to have enough quiet to participate in a Zoom lesson with her school. She was embarrassed. She didn't want to put the Zoom video on. So as you can see, for some kids, especially I think of kids of frontline workers, you've got a lot of barriers to being able to participate compared to affluent families who can set up a desk, an internet connection, and their parents are right there to help them figure things out. That's a big difference for kids. Alicia, let's turn to the role of the state in all of this. Do you feel that the state has been doing the work they need to to provide guidance and help schools, teachers, and students, and parents succeed? during this time. Uh, what should they be doing if, if you feel that they're not doing what they should be? So we at I Trust Less believe that there's a lot more that the state can be doing. You know, there is a lot of language in the trailer bill right now that does provide some guidance around instructional minutes and whether a student should get live instruction versus asynchronous instruction. However, there's a lot of room for interpretation and what is currently there. And we know that when there are no guardrails and we are getting a lot of disparity in terms of what one school district is providing versus another, that is something that definitely leads to inequities. And so there's really a greater role the, play, the state could play in terms of outlining some more, much more consistency across districts and across schools in the state. And Alicia, despite these enormous challenges around distance learning, you see this as an opportunity for some reboot to happen within the educational system. Well, we're really at a crossroads moment, you know, between the recent murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others and the coronavirus, um, we have come to a moment where we can really continue to recreate the inequities in the education system that were already there or we can really work to create something new. And to create something new, there are some schools that are doing things like really thinking about how do they assess students when they come back, not in punitive ways, but in ways that really help them understand where students are to take them from where they are to where they need to go over the course of the year. They're providing small group instruction. They're having a lot more interaction one-on-one -on -one between teachers and students. All things that we know students really need and in some ways, we could use this as an opportunity to really recreate education in ways that we've needed to for far too long. Alicia, thank you. Julia, we put out a call on Facebook to our viewers, and one of them asks how school districts are planning to make testing available for staff, especially if and when we move to a hybrid of online and in-person instruction. Well, the state guidelines have said that schools are supposed to regularly test staff. How are they supposed to do that and who's supposed to pay for it? At the moment, what they're saying is that um, staff should be tested by community testing sites. And as we know, there has been a movement to get uh, insurance companies to pay uh, for any testing of, of, of frontline workers or essential workers and teachers are considered essential workers. So the idea is if you're a teacher in a school, it's not going to be the school paying for this, at least on paper right now. They're saying you send this, send mm -hmm. folks to a community te testing center and then also send them to their own um, sort of health, health service and have that pick up the cost. And Alicia, what do you think will make the key difference between those school districts that succeed this year with distance learning and those that don't? So we know one of the most important things that we heard both from the parent poll and continue to hear from uh, organizations across the state is it's going to be pivotal for school districts to partner with parents and make sure that they're providing materials to parents in languages that are their native language. We also know it's going to be super important to really partner deeply with educators and ensure that they have the professional development and tools that they need to really be able to help students and we also know that funding for all this is going to be crucial. We know that we'll need more funds from the federal government, and we know that there are some propositions on the ballot, like Prop 16, 
which can really help infuse more funds in targeted ways to the students who need it most. And I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to push those three things in more school districts across the state. Julia McAvoy with KQED, Alicia Smith Ariaga with Education Trust West. Thank you both so much for joining us. Good to be here. Counties that are on California's coronavirus monitoring list may only provide school services online. Once a county has been off that watch list for two weeks, a school district may choose to provide in-person instruction again. But teacher unions in Contra Costa and Alameda County say that regulation doesn't go far enough. They argue that using countywide averages will lead to inequitable and unsafe situations, and that more detailed zip code data needs to be used instead. With me now by Skype from Berkeley is Marissa Glidden, the president of the United Teachers of Richmond and a former elementary school teacher. And joining by Skype from Elsa Bronte is Shakira Reynolds, a parent of two boys with special needs and the co-founder of the Parent Leadership Council in the West Contra Costa Unified School District. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us Thank today. you. Marissa, I'd like to start with you. What is your concern about using countywide data to reopen school districts? So I think countywide data really isn't painting the real story of what's going on in our counties. So for example, in I, I teach in Contra Costa County. In Contra Costa County, San Pablo has three times the number of cases as this countywide average. That means when students in San Pablo go back to school, it is likely that they're gonna go back with a greater likelihood of passing that virus to the students. And so we need to be using a zip code data and making sure that every single zip code meets the requirements before going back to school. Your position is that no school should reopen until all schools can reopen within a within the county, yes? Isn't that punitive to the students in those districts that have lower infection rates? So I think the bottom line is we want kids back in school. You know, classrooms are meant to be physical. We're meant to be in the school working with our students, um, but it is not safe to return until it's safe for every single student. And if you look at the countywide data, the places where there is the biggest um, discrepancy between the cases is where there mostly are essential workers, our black and brown students, our English language learners, our foster and homeless youth, they are more likely to have families that are essential workers, therefore their case count is higher. So by opening schools on countywide averages, we're actually putting them in really unsafe situations. And I really believe we all need to come together and put a pressure on our county and local governments to make sure we're putting contact tracing and testing in those communities so we can all be safe to go back to school together. Shakira, you have two boys who are young and in school. What has your experience with distance learning been like and what are you expecting for the fall? Quite honestly, my experience has been inconsistent. One child had a great experience, a great teacher who really jumped in with the distance learning program, and my other son had a teacher who struggled. Luckily, I feel like the teachers and the district have really put a lot of effort into making sure that the fall will be a different experience. And so I'm expecting that things will go better, but it's still gonna be difficult. I have two young children who will both need my constant assistance in order to participate in the program. Are there any steps that could make distance learning a better experience for you and for your children? Um, I think that some of the steps that we are taking with the new MOU that just came out with UTR just this week is making sure we're having more consistent scheduling, that there is more uh, in involvement from the site leaders and the central office. Increased parent training is really, really important and making sure that we have policies in place to make sure that our neediest students, those who have difficulty accessing distance learning in the past, who don't have consistent Wi-Fi and things like that, we will have a better experience than we had in the spring during what was really emergency learning. It wasn't a distance learning program. Mm -hmm. Marissa, earlier today, your union, the United Teachers of Richmond, reached a deal with the West Contra Costa Unified School District for distance learning. Can you tell me about any specific pieces related to equity in that deal and what a typical day is going to look like? 
Yeah, I think that the focus we really had when making this deal was equity. And to do that, we worked really directly with our parents, um, with Shakira and the Parent Leadership Council, to make sure they were involved in what it looked like from the parent perspective. And just like Shakira said, it was crisis learning. You know, teachers overnight had to figure out how do I take what I learned in the, uh, in the classroom and years of learning how to become a teacher and do it online. And so this new MOU really allows for number one, more training for our teachers. So they are going to be um, really prepared to do this with a special training on race and equity. Uh, every Friday, three Fridays a month, our teachers will get an hour and a half of race and equity um, professional development, uh, which will really help make sure that we're bringing all that we're learning back when we come back to the classroom physically as well. Shakira, most of this conversation around equity has been framed in terms of race. You think it should be broader. Can you tell us about that? Well, I am both a black parent, obviously, but I also have children with special needs. So there is the concerns of equity for children like mine. How are their needs being met in both the distance learning program and in a physical classroom setting? And as a parent, we have so many balls to juggle, your therapies and IEPs and different things like that. And so in every conversation, I always want those needs to also be centered with race and class and income and all of these things have to be part of the conversations that we're having. Shakira, do you feel you're getting the support you need from your school district? Um, I feel like we are on the road to getting the support that we need. I do feel like my voice was heard when I had problems during the spring, and I am cautiously optimistic. I, I read all 20 plus pages of the MOU. I see special education <laughs> mentioned explicitly. And my, as I said, my older son had an amazing teacher. She did centers on Zoom with special needs children. And so I expect to have a better experience than I had in, um, in the spring. We received a question on Facebook from one of our viewers, um, and Marissa, I'd like to put it to you. They're wondering if schools will be equipped with enough counselors to help students deal with the stress and anxiety that crop up during distance learning. Is your school district requiring mental health counselors to be part of this distance learning process? So this is such a great and important question. Uh, and the answer is no. And I actually don't know of any districts that are actually doing this right now. Hmm. And the problem is we don't have enough funding to make this possible. You know, it's so clear during this crisis learning that schools are central to our community. You know, we, we had teachers draw us, um, handing out the free and reduced lunch. We had teachers dropping off supplies. We had teachers becoming really, you know, the mental health support in addition to the educational professionals for their students. And we need to fund schools like they are the community centers that they really have been serving our community. So um, no, we are not doing that. I think that's something that uh, we need to step up and do as a state. We need to invest in these services for our students. They really deserve it during this crisis, especially. With this lack of access to schools in person and the personnel that go along with that, uh, many parents have been scrambling and they have often been creating these so-called pandemic pods where a few people will come together uh, with their kids to share childcare, potentially hire a tutor or a teacher to educate their children in a smaller group setting in a private setting. And there's been a lot of criticism of this specifically in terms of equity. Uh, Shakira, I'm curious what you think about pandemic pods and if you know anyone who's doing this. So actually I do know someone that's participating, but from a very different standpoint than what you've just mentioned, she is in San Jose and is doing this be, because the teachers in San Jose are being required to be in their classrooms during distance learning. And so she is creating a pod with teachers' children who were classmates of her son, um, but also because there are some essential workers who need that level of support. And I think they're getting lost. The need for child care for essential workers is getting lost in the discussion of pandemic pods as only something that is available um, to people of, of certain means. Um, I, I still 
if it, it's just talking about people who have the money to take people out of the teaching force and ask them to work in their homes, then I feel like we're misdirecting our resources and really not looking toward the county and state to say, let's do all that we can to get this virus not under control because we cannot, but to reduce the, um, the infections and make our public schools safe for everyone to return. Because we know for a lot of families, private tutoring and teaching and things is right. just not an option. It's just out of reach. Yeah, Shakira Reynolds, Parent Leadership Council, and Marissa Glidden, the United Teachers of Richmond. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now that school is coming back, many working parents may find it difficult to keep up with the demands of their children's distance learning and their own work schedule. This pressure has had a negative impact on the mental health of parents and their kids, struggling with uncertainty and upended routines. With me now by Skype from San Francisco is UCSF Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. William Martinez. Dr. Martinez, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So as a psychologist, can you briefly describe for us what mental health challenges you're seeing in your parent patients, particularly around distance education? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we're seeing a lot of hardship with our families right now. I'm a director of a clin outpatient clinic here. Um, we primarily serve folks on public insurance, so these are lower income families. Um, and what we're seeing is a lot of struggling around figuring out how to provide the kids education if these parents are working from home how they're able to both work from home and do the second job of, of being the educator for their kids um, for folks who are frontline essential workers uh, we're seeing a lot of stress about to figure out how they're now able to either provide child care or have child care provided for their kids at home and their education provided while they're out working plus the worries associated with being an essential worker and potentially being at higher risk of being exposed to COVID-19 and bringing that back home to their family members. I'm curious how much higher a level of mental health uh, struggle that you're seeing these days through the pandemic and going into the school year. Yeah, uh, I, I could safely say, and I'm talking to colleagues in, you know, around the country who, who are in similar clinics and working with similar populations that we're seeing depression, anxiety, a lot of mental health symptoms go through the roof right now. Um, right now, we're having a lot of folks who are highly stressed, highly anxious, um, being many times socially isolated in their homes uh, and not really having much in terms of resources to get out there. We're seeing our mental health system stressed right now. Uh, school was often a respite, both for parents and kids and a way for kids to socialize. That's not there in many parts, especially here in San Francisco. Um, so folks are, are, we're really starting to see an uptick. Um, we're starting to see a lot more mental health symptoms. Kids who've had, were at risk for these problems before, their problems are going up. Um, and it's, it's a great concern, you know, right now. So what advice do you have for parents in this very stressful and uncertain time? The advice really is number one, uh, parents really need to be mindful of, of their own anxiety, their own stress. Self-care is so important. Um, if you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of your own child. You know, children really and young children, adolescents, they feed off their parents anxiety and stress. They'll, if you're stressed, they're going to be stressed as well. Mm -hmm. um, second is to really have faith in yourself, your family's ability to handle hardship. Um, every family has been through hardship before. Um, every family has their way of dealing with things. Trust that even in this time, that's something we've never been through as a society, that you really uh, have the skill set in your family to, to, to help um, kind of manage this. Um, but self-care is gonna be key for parents. And what are you hearing from school-age children about their emotional struggles during this time? Again, a lot of it with, with this inability to social distance, right? Um, uh, especially in our adolescent population, you know, this is a time for, uh, uh, independence, a time to, where they're building their own identities, and really uh, with not having school, not having these abilities to socialize or, or less abilities to do that, um, they're struggling, right? Um, you know, a lot of times we still have Zoom and other uh, forms of social media to interact, but these in-person interactions are so important and being able to do things together. For our younger kids, there's just a lot of anxiety and worry. Younger kids don't really understand the 
the grand scale of this. Um, they're just seeing that people are anxious, people are wearing masks, there's a scary virus. Am I potentially going to die? I'm hearing about people dying. So they're, we're seeing that they're experiencing a lot of anxiety and worry. Um, and really need some supports around that. Well, let's talk about masks. Public health officials advise that anybody over the age of two wears a mask in public. How are you seeing different age groups respond to this requirement to wear masks? So with, with our adolescents, I'll start there. You know, like adolescents just by nature of that uh, stage of development tend to be more risk takers, tend to kind of think that, you know, whatever's going on in the world doesn't impact them or, or they're, you know, more invisible than others. Um, just by that very nature, we see that some of them just, you know, maybe don't want to wear masks or feel like they can be safe without wearing them. So there's some reticence there. I think it's important to treat them as adults, talk to them about the importance and why and really how this is protecting others and how important and what their role could be. With our younger kids, it's just annoying. You know, it could be it's hot, it's scratchy, it's, you know, and they're, it, it's hard for them to keep up with that, um, especially a lot of masks. There are masks out there that are made for younger kids, but they're not the most comfortable. So we do see annoyance around that. But there, with the younger kids, we're seeing that they're likely to wear the mask if you really explain why they should. This is a time in which kids who should be learning all the rules of socialization are being forced to stay apart and to social distance. Can you tell us how this may impact their growth and their development in the years to come? Yeah, that's a great question. These, these are part of this larger question about how we think about recovery from COVID-19, right? A lot of times we think about recovery in terms of folks uh, who tested positive and now need some rehabilitation for as they're coming out uh, and, and coming over the illness. But really as a society, how are we recovering for COVID-19? If we really don't think about um, these larger kind of public health issues and think about how we can provide this in the interim, you know, thinking about how we can get creative about spaces for these kids um, and creating specific spaces for socialization, we do stand to see what, you know, some issues later on down the line and downstream ramifications of uh, this lack of socialization right now. So I do think it's important that our public health folks, our you know planning folks all think about this and, and think about how we can deal with this in the interim in a safe manner. Dr. William Martinez with UCSF, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, appreciate you having me. You can find more of our coverage at kqed.org slash kqed newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Priya D. Clemens. From all of us here at KQED, thanks for watching. Good night.